within the uh, jazz tradition, we, we would call this, this whole discussion great composers steal because uh, Stravinsky, Igor Stravinsky was known for a, 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 um, uh, a quote himself that said, good composers borrow and great composers steal. Um, and that is his way of saying it's very rare that you will find a piece that just exists in and of itself in a bubble. Instead, you're going to find that some of the music, like the Rite of Spring, which he wrote, was actually derived completely from folk tunes, from Russian folk tunes. So there's music that's already um, in existence that's pretty useful. Um, within jazz, there are the simple limitations of Western music that are going to, um, that are going to constrain us um, in terms of what we consider borrowing and what we consider new material. In a Western scale, we only have 12. 11 notes, and then you repeat on the 12th notes. Um, so within 12, given that there are millions of melodies and millions of tunes and millions of harmonic structures, there's going to be some overlap. There has to be. An example is, uh, if you hear this, my colleague in the music department pointed this out to me. If you heard... You probably think, twinkle, twinkle, little star, right? But if I go... You could sing, what a wonderful world. And, and those two tunes are based on the same uh, sort of pitch structure. So there's going to be coincidence. One other quick example is Sibelius' Fifth Symphony starts. That's how it starts. Thelonious Monks Around Midnight starts. So the shape is very much the same with a slight inflection, modal inflection. I mean, you know, if one wanted to look hard enough, you probably could find a doppelganger for almost any tune. I'm, I'm fascinated when jazz artists quote from within the genre of jazz, and they'll quote each other. Um, but sometimes the jazz artist chooses a piece that's very familiar, and he or she will expand upon that piece. A, a famous well-known tune is I'm in the mood for love. Okay, so what I did was I played the normal melody, the upper line on top of it, but basically in terms of background this is what's going on. This is, that's the accompaniment. That's the left hand part. Um, there's a great artist named James Moody who heard that tune and said, instead of even starting with the melody, I'm in the mood for love, he would do it this way. And, and it, it would surprise me if you don't recognize this right away. Pretty baby, you are the soul that steps my control. Such a funny thing, but every time you hear me, I never can be a. You give me a smile, but I'm That's the first chorus of the tune. The, the chords have been altered a little bit, but he consciously was using the background chords from I'm in the Mood for Love, and he's reconstructed what went on on top. Okay, that sounds legitimate. It sounds like a new thing. Now, what people don't listen for is that this takes place in the middle of that solo. Listen. Am I insane or do I really see heaven in You heard that, right? Now, this is a piece called Country Dances by Percy Granger that was written in the 19... I think he got it all arranged in 1918. Um... <laughs> Okay, just so you'll hear it again. 
this is where the interesting part. Dun di da dun dun da di a da dun da da de. And then if you hear, you know. Am I insane or do I really see heaven in? Okay, so this is James Moody very consciously kind of grabbing a moment. This is a spontaneous moment in African American musical practice. It is very normal to sort of be aware of yourself in history and aware of what, what measures of command you have of your voice, of your instrument. So it's a way of what Henry Louis Gates calls signifying. It shows the, you know, that I can work this into a tune that wouldn't have had it otherwise. So within jazz, this is kind of an ideal to be able to grab something out of nowhere. This is, and that's quite a few notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's like eleven notes worth of quotation. Is that substantial similarity? I don't know. You tell me. And there are uh, compositions that uh, involve uh, the, the concept of variation or transformation. It uses a certain theme and then it expands upon it. That is the entire jazz tradition. Now, in classical music, it's a premeditated moment. You, you, you either ask someone, can I, can I uh, use your piece and write variations on it, or you grab a piece that's before the, public, before the copyright um, laws came into effect, and you use that as a, as a theme for variation. Why would I do it? That's what Jennifer told me to explain. Why would I quote, you know? Um, I did it because I was interested in a particular technique within a lot of works. And um, that technique is a break. That means that the music suddenly stops and something happens in the space in between. And um, as I was writing my orchestra piece, which is full of breaks, I thought about, well, who's got some great breaks? And it, uh, Michael Jackson, okay? He's got some great breaks. you'll recognize is don't stop till you get enough. And I'm using that rhythm even in the tom. Now the difference is I decided, well, at the risk of, of showing up in court and having to deal with this, I have to transform it. And I interspersed a few of my own ideas and also turned the contour upside down. Became Is it legal? I don't know. Is it, is it familiar? Yes, intentionally so, because I wanted people to connect breaks with my piece, with Michael Jackson's breaks. As someone who may be borrowed one day or someone who has done the borrowing. I think um, intention and purpose is a big deal to the, to the artist. Um, if it's intended, intended for mass commercial purpose, it, it would really be to someone's advantage to get in contact with the artist if possible. If, on the other hand, it is intended for educational or for local, demonstrative or exploratory artistic purpose, I don't think um, artists get as riled up about that. And I don't think that that discussion takes place as much. Um, I, I, maybe I'm wrong, but the, the question of, of where the artists themselves are coming from as people who would be borrowed. Sure, when someone's piece you know, suddenly is a commercial success and they've used something small in some way, um, that does kind of sting a little bit, I'm sure. But when it comes down to it, um, uh, we all have to see music. It's, there's, there's nothing we come up with that's new, that's brand new. I mean, that's really broadly philosophical, but that's where I, that is where I and many, many other musicians who, who create what we call new music, that's where we stand.